Good morning. I'm Mark Allen with Gaper.io, and I'm here today with Rich Bilek, the CEO of Global Technology Partners. Good morning, Rich. How you doing? Very good. Good to talk with you, Mark. Nice. I'm glad you could join us today. So to start with, can you share a brief background of yourself and your work experience? Be glad to do that. Uh, my background has been in the uh, payments industry. I've worked in many aspects uh, with banks such as Citibank, uh, with Visa, and currently uh, I'm CEO of Global Technology Partners, which is a fintech focused on uh, payment technology with a market focus of the emerging payment markets and economies of Sub-Saharan Africa. Oh, wow, that's quite interesting. Um, is there a lot going on in that um, neck of the world or uh, neck of the woods? <laughs> well, there is, it is. You know, Africa uh, was introduced to me because of my work with Visa. Uh, I've been in the payments industry for almost 40 years now. Uh, I've been working half the time with large companies like Visa. In between, I've been in entrepreneurial roles, which is where I am on now with, uh, with GTP. But the uh, convergence of my career in Visa and Africa happened with Visa. I was head of their prepaid business in, uh, based in Dubai for mm. the Samia region, which included Africa. And Africa, outside of the uh, US for Visa, was the biggest prepaid market. And I got to know Global Technology Partners, GTP, because they were the biggest visa a processor or processor supporting visa business in Africa. And what's happening there in Africa, the, the prepaid is an easy entry product. It's lower cost than setting up a visa or debit card or a visa credit card. And it doesn't require the credit oversight. So it made it easy to address the, the needs of the millions of unbanked consumers in Africa that are looking to get access to uh, to the e-commerce markets, uh, to the Amazons of the world. And we're right in the middle of that. Oh, that's quite fast. So, I mean, while we're on it, why don't you basically tell us what Global Technology Partner is all about, um, who, you, who you partner with, who, who is your target audience? I'm, I'm assuming it's rather large. Well, it is. Uh, Global Technology Partners, uh, interesting. It's a connection how Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is where the business is based, got connected to Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso. I'll, I'll, I'll start with that, that headline. Uh, Global Technology Partners is a payment processor. And basically what we do is enable uh, banks that issue Visa and MasterCard to connect to those networks globally. And prepaid is a specialized technology that uh, has required or directed many banks to go to a third party to provide it. So our origins come from a, a predecessor company uh, called Financial Stored Value. Uh, they did prepaid in the US. Uh, they did programs for large companies like uh, uh, McDonald's. Uh, our founder was one of the investors. He wanted to grow a business outside the US. So Global Technology Partners was spun off. Uh, the original company actually was acquired by a US bank uh, out of Minneapolis. And we've continued on the goal was to be non-US. And initially though, it was gonna be Latin America. We thought Panama would be our, our first uh, uh, market. It didn't pan out, uh, the pro partnerships and programs didn't evolve, but we got noticed by uh, some entrepreneurs out of Africa and particularly uh, bringing in two salespeople, one who was uh, the uh, national uh, uh, discus champion for Cote d'Ivoire. So we have a mm. athlete coming in who had the Africa ties. And then uh, our uh, 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 colleague from Monticello, Arkansas, who uh, entrepreneur who had done a prepaid card with uh, Magic Johnson. And the two of them got together, connected with our founder who had the platform that would enable this and basically connected with the group out of Burkina Faso that wanted to offer this product. They saw the need and persistence paid off. It took about nine months for them to negotiate on site there in Ouagadougou. Uh, and the deal was struck about a dozen years ago. Wow, that's amazing. And it's interesting how Ouagadougou just blows right off your blows tongue. Off. <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a famous person on TV that uses that, uh, Burkina Faso, what's the capital of that? As, as one of his questions from time to time. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah, it's it's a small landlocked country. The, but it was it was having the capability, and you can call it serendipity. But it happens when you recognize, you know, an opportunity because you know what you need, 
and you have the ability to fulfill it. The, the next step was uh, that the bank in Burkina Faso was acquired by a Pan-African bank, United Bank for Africa, which is based out of Lagos, Nigeria. They liked the product, took it to their network, which was in 20 countries. Hmm. And then four years later, this is about mid, well, say 2014, 2015, Echo Bank, which is an even larger Pan-African bank, uh, also signed on to our services. So we went from Ouagadougou to uh, 32 countries in Africa, uh, 75 banks, and we work with uh, Visa and MasterCard with regional players in Africa to connect the, uh, the banks and other fintechs to those networks so they can offer their customers uh, the access, the utility, the, uh, the capabilities that uh, those networks give you access to. Very interesting. So you've mentioned a number of countries already. So I'm assuming you're familiar with remote employment. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. Yes. So what has been your experience with it? I mean, do you, I, you're in Illinois, I know, but do you have, and you've also mentioned, uh, I think it was uh, Oklahoma or one of the. Yes. Yes. So do you have offices all over the world or it sounds like you have them definitely in the U.S.? We, we do. We do throughout Africa. The, the, the focus is really in, uh, in the U.S. is Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's where our founder was. That's where the uh, software development is, the operations, the customer service, the support. Uh, there are about 50 staff there. Hmm. And then, uh, and I had lived there for about six years. In the last year, I moved up here, focusing more on the external uh, relationships, business development. And then we have uh, staff and offices in uh, Africa and Europe. Uh, in Africa, it's uh, Abidjan, which is in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, it's uh, Lagos in Nigeria. We'll soon add uh, Accra, Ghana, and uh, Kigali, uh, uh, excuse me, Kigali in uh, uh, Uganda. And oh, no, I'm sorry, that's a Kampala in Uganda. So they'll, they'll be there. Those tend to be sales offices, but we're beginning to add more sales capability uh, and then we have a specialized program that provides uh, prepaid payroll services to the maritime industry. And we have staff in Madrid and Barcelona as well. Wow. So have you traveled to most of these places yourself? Oh, yes, that's been I've enjoyed it very much. It's uh, it's uh, uh, been exciting to see these different countries and cultures. It's made a difference in our business to have the face to face contact um, and uh, be able to uh, uh, you know, make that, that physical connection. But we've also found now during these COVID times that uh, we can augment that. So we've worked, worked through that. But yeah, that's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Although I'm, uh, you know, it's been nine months. My last trip was uh, mid, mid-March. Uh, mm -hmm. We were in meetings with our partners in Dubai, in the UAE. And all of a sudden, they, even you know, you'd fly whatever six, seven thousand miles, and they're saying, "Okay, we have the meeting, but we'll do it by phone." And literally, it was like a hundred yards away from their office. And I said it was time to get on a plane, and flew back. And since uh, the Ides of March, I've been, I've been back here in the U.S. Yeah, it was March sixteenth, actually. You're right, the day after the Ides. So it, interestingly, that we brought this up. I mean, the the pandemic caused everybody to go remote, and it was March sixteenth for the date in the Bay Area. I know. Um, did that cause any challenges or roadblocks that you didn't expect? It, it didn't. In fact, it went smoother than I thought, and it forced some changes that maybe we should have made anyway, that um, uh, we had in our, our staff about 60 people in Tulsa, and always a requirement that, you know, uh, even you, you had to work from the desk. Uh, we found within a short time we had a you couldn't do that and it was embraced i'd say by 95 percent of the staff that they could have more flexibility in in mm -hmm. their work environment their work hours I, I think what helped us were two factors one a technology company where we had people available the the infrastructure was there for people to deploy uh to their home and second it's a team that's been together for quite a long time uh so we weren't bringing in a lot of new people it's it's i'd say you know, of the 60, maybe, you know, 55 had been there well over a year and more than half had been there four or five years. So we knew each other and we didn't have, I think it'd be more challenging if it was a new team that hadn't met each other to try to build the same uh, esprit de corps or camaraderie. Um, so it, it really worked a lot better. And, and for the Tulsa office, uh, 
Mark, we, we've actually downsized. We had a chance to renegotiate our lease and starting next, next year in, in March, we'll probably be at half the space, even though we'll have slightly larger staff. So that worked really well. And then for our, our, our BD team, which is remotely based in Africa and Europe, we'd always had work that way. So it really hadn't made much of a difference. Um, the fine tuning there, I'd say, is we've moved more from WebEx to Zoom and now doing more uh, Google Meets and Microsoft Teams mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, you know, getting that. And that's actually been favored by our banks. It's, it's more economical for them to connect during the, through the internet rather than from phone calls or, or uh, you know, conference call numbers. Yeah, so I mean, and, and now that they, they do have a vaccine, you, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but what do you think is gonna be the future of remote employment now that you're, you're, I mean, I hear this all the time where now people have done it, they're like, we should have done this five years ago. Right. Is, is that how you're gonna look at it? I mean, it sounds like it since you're downsizing your office space. Yes, I think, well, a tale of two worlds, perhaps in the US out of our Tulsa office, I think uh, it has happened, I see us, uh, needing less space, reconfiguring the space so that there's more of uh, hoteling. You come in as you need. We'll keep a core group there, more of our network team that'll keep the basic utilities running and more conference rooms. Likely that people may get together uh, periodically once a month or once a week. Uh, for what that will do, I think for our, um, uh, our Africa team and Europe team, we may actually deploy more people there. We're actually going to uh, set up a, a new office in Accra, for example. It's a growing market for us in Ghana. Uh, what we will do is find that we can uh, use that Africa footprint. It's going to help us better serve our customers. A fundamental challenge we've had is you wake up in uh, Tulsa or Chicago at, you know, go to work, start at eight in the morning. It's already two in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, we now will have more of the capability remotely enabling our customer service team in Ghana to, uh, you know, when it's midnight here, they're already, you know, already getting the day started and serving our customers. So we're, we're finding the remote work is going to enable us to better uh, support and deploy staff in, in our African offices. Wow, that's great. So uh, uh, finally, you know, there's, there's companies like Gaper that, that um, service this market where we provide remote development. You're doing that out of Tulsa. But how do you how do you see that happening going forward for a lot of companies that now that they've had a taste of this are like hey we can do different services out of anywhere in the world? It's it's something we're we're taking uh, more advantage of, uh, and some of it is driven actually driven more by just the uh, I guess maybe a second uh, impact of COVID for payments more contactless more digital uh, uh, types of payments more wallets. And there are underlying capabilities we need to develop where we're looking at third parties to help us deliver that and, and viewing our role being more of a good uh, packager and uh, retailer of these services. So we are you know, actively looking at other players um, that are in the uh, ecosystem of payments, some in Europe, some in Africa, where we'll, um, we will, we will uh, look to uh, uh, collaborate with them. It's, uh, it just gets us gets us uh, more quickly to market, and I think what's important is with the the, the uh, third parties, these remote development is we can test that. We're not quite sure what the right solution is going to be, so why not test it quickly before mm -hmm. we decide what we really want to build and own? So right. we're seeing more of that more of that this year, and based on how we see performance of various initiatives next year, we'll decide what to own and what to to rent. Mm, very interesting, Walt. Well, well, Rich, I want to thank you for your time today. It's, it's fascinating, and it, it was really fascinating the way you just rattled off all those African <laughs> cities. <laughs> you, you could go on Jeopardy with, all, with your knowledge of all that stuff. So I want to uh, thank you again, and have a great week. Well, you too. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.